My introduction for Tom Slay begins with a sentence uh, whose profundity surprises even me, so, so I'll, I'll give you that and then I'll pause for a second. <clears throat> if you live long enough, you get to experience some interesting reconnections, the closing of some gaps, the completion of some circles, and the expansion and deepening of your sense of kinship with others who are like you in some serious ways. Tom Slay and I met for coffee in, we think, 1982 in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Actually, my text says 1979 because that's what I have believed until tonight when Tom and I compared notes on the, on the deep past. So there we were in a coffee shop in Harvard Square. We were both informally students of the poet Frank Bedart, and we showed each other poems, and we found ourselves disagreeing quite a bit about poetry, what poetry should do and what makes it good. I think I remember Tom saying that when I wrote him a letter critiquing his poems, it, it pissed him off so much that he threw the letter out a window. <clears throat> we had different personalities and different life experiences, and we were emphasizing our differences because self-definition was an issue. Where I tended to see comedy and enjoyable irony everywhere, Tom tended to see existential crisis and desperate emergency everywhere. <clears throat> okay, that, that is a simplistic comparison. <clears throat> but there's, there's some truth in it, and the difference was real. But we had in common a strong feeling that poems should seek truth, should push through the surfaces of conventional perceptions toward deeper, often more disturbing or embarrassing realizations. Tom Slay is a fiercely ambitious poet determined to confront painful, scary subjects such as the human propensity for inflicting suffering on others in many awful ways, both physical and psychological. As Angie Mazakis points out in her article on Tom Slay in our festival magazine, the range of subjects in his work is very wide but the common denominator is that he moves toward rather than away from whatever he finds most troubling. It makes sense that when Tom has had opportunities to travel to terribly dangerous places, such as Lebanon, Iraq, Somalia, as a literary journalist, he has seized those opportunities, whereas I think I would always have run the other way. There's nothing shy or cautious or light about Tom Slay's poetry. He holds himself to a standard of seriousness that reminds me of William Blake and Percy Shelley. In his poem, Proof of Poetry, in his newest book, Station Z, Station Z, <coughs> Slay looks back at self-destructive tendencies in his early life and he says that his life felt like scraps stitched together in a dream, a dream forgotten because it has to be forgotten, but that I looked for desperately, but only sporadically found in fragments, a hand lifted to strike or caress or simply lifted for some unknown reason, and in memory, too, some specific pain, sensation of cold or warmth. I loved that harmony in all its stages of passion, the voices still talking inside me. But then instead of harmony, there was nothing but rags scattered on the ground. And maybe that's all it means to be a poet. <clears throat> In that passage, I admire the unflinching intensity, the determination to see and say the largest possible truth about one's own pattern of experience. You and I also, have felt the way that a sense of harmony in your life can dissolve into a chaos of scattered rags until 
imagination somehow constructs a newer sensation of or illusion of harmony. Thus, even if stylistically I'm still at a distance from Slay's stern and bleak and sometimes harsh high style, as I was already in that coffee shop in Cambridge at least 35 years ago, I can, I can recognize my own inner life in what Slay describes there as a poet's challenge. Tom Slay has expressed his sense of life with tremendous energy throughout eight books of poems. As the poet J.D. McClatchy has written, all those things we'd rather not hear about, war, disease, physical and moral corruption, the nightmare of family, the heartbreak of love, we hear about those things in the poems of Tom Slay. And it turns out we do want to hear about all this when the poetry comes from such an ambitious, uncompromising, profoundly unrelaxed poet. Please welcome Tom Slay. Well, I didn't throw it out the window. <laughs> Anyway, Mark, thank you very much for that. Uh, you know, this is one of those moments where um, your life passes before your eyes. Uh, it'll pass very quickly, so don't worry. Uh, and I remember sitting, you know, being seated in that coffee shop with Mark Halliday, and uh, we both had more hair. Uh, but there was something so direct and passionate. Uh, I've always loved Mark's work uh, because of that, and also because of the adventurousness of the idiom that he uses so beautifully. So it, it means a huge amount to me, and uh, 35 years is a long fucking time. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm really grateful. And uh, I just want to say a word about, I, I want to thank everybody here uh, today. I'm particularly grateful to uh, uh, my, my fellow folks and uh, to all of you for coming and, um, you know, Everybody who has made this thing so easy uh, to do, I, I really, really deeply appreciate it. Um, and I'll, I'll just say a word about, um, you know, at, at a certain point, um, we've had fairies, we've had the surreal, uh, we've had uh, a lecture as a form of uh, performance as opposed to a display of knowledge. Uh, you know, we've had uh, a kind of excavation of Philadelphia in which everything is uh, super fine-grained, fine distinctions. And then we've had, you know, a, a whole uh, history about the, you know, founding of the Irish National Theater, the Abbey Theater, in which uh, even though class structures may not have changed, class aspirations did. And so I'm going to try to pick up all of those threads. Uh, yeah, sure you will. <laughs> but anyway, I thought it'd be good to say. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll just start with that poem that uh, Mark mentioned. It's called Proof of Poetry. Start. The timer is running. Don't worry. It's past my bedtime, too. Proof of poetry. I wanted first to end up as a drunk in the gutter. And in my twenties, I almost ended up there. And then as an alternative to vodka, to live alone like a hermit philosopher and court the extreme poverty that I suspected lay in store for me anyway. And then there were the years in which I needed very badly to take refuge in mediocrity. Years like blunt scissors cutting out careful squares. And that was the worst, the very worst. You could say that always my life was like a patchwork quilt always ripped apart. My life like scraps stitched together in a dream in which animals and people, plants 
chimeras, stars, even minerals were in a preordained harmony. A dream forgotten because it has to be forgotten, but that I looked for desperately, but only sporadically found in fragments, a hand lifted to strike or caress, or simply lifted for some unknown reason. And in memory, too, some specific pain, sensation of cold or warmth, I love that harmony in all its stages of passion, the voices still talking inside me. But then, instead of harmony, there was nothing but rags scattered on the ground. And maybe that's all it means to be a poet. Um, you know, Gerald talked about dogs, and uh, I'm going to read a poem uh, about dogs. Um, I, I'm going to try to read the, a poem in which I try to actually get inside the head of a dog. Um, and uh, you know how a dog will look at you, and then look at the door, and then look back at you, and what to call that. Um, that's a kind of language. So anyway, also the thing about dogs is when you look into a dog's eyes, there's all this stuff about the dogs being man's best friend or woman's best friend or however you want to put that old saw. And when you look at a dog, there's that moment when the, um, the tapetum lucidum on the back of the dog's eyes kind of do that devil flash. And you go, whoa. Hmm. So, this has a bit of that in it. What the dog really says. It wasn't language, but eyeage, the dog spoke. Looking at the door, then at me, then at the door. Its eyes signaling something more than what Chekhov said the dog smelled in each corner of the room. The unquestioned superiority of human beings. Nor was it what Nietzsche thought when he wrote that a dog comes up to the philosopher as if to ask a question, but then forgets the question. For there was no question when the dog licked the hand there was a smell of a kind that the dog must have known so well from when the hand took it out for walks and the dog plunged its nose into frozen meat of a gull on a day so cold only the faintest microbial whiffs of rot could thread their way up the dog's nostrils and knot and unknot in its brain. What the dog really says is that if a dog could talk, we couldn't understand it. And so the dog moves in harmony of nose to smell, claws clicking on the sidewalk as it marks with a squirt this tree, that fence post, the laminar overlays of scent like pages leaf through in a diary in which each entry keeps changing in a present that has no future but only a fading past. For three days and nights, the dog didn't move from under the bed where the man whose hand it licked for the salts on the hand, the subtly changing salts, lay unmoving. But why did the dog keep lying there once the body was zipped away into a body bag wrestled onto a gurney as the undertaker, unshaven in rumpled white shirt with maybe gravy stains on the collar, his black slacks and jacket fitting a little too tight, tried to make the dog move until the dog showed its teeth and began to bark. 
What's in the dog-hearted, dog-brained dog's heart? And why would we say that a dog is afraid his master will beat him today, but not that a dog is afraid his master will beat him tomorrow? The salts on the man's hand, did they smell and taste of what a dog smells and tastes when it rolls on its back in half-rotten flesh and comes running with that odor wafting from its matted down fur toward the hand that feeds it and that it licks? Things to be eaten, smelled, sat upon, run away from, Things that die, but don't make a dog fearful. The many ways dogs bark in the dwindling languages. Bow wow, bluff bluff, how how, gong gong, jia jia. What does the dog know of this? Its features scrunching up into a puggish, wrinkled, I'm worried. Shouldn't you be, face? This is a... I guess, you know, this is my response uh, to uh, Colm's wonderful uh, talk about uh, Lady Gregory and Yeats in the Irish Theater. Um, you know, I was in a high school play. And I, I it was typecasting. It was Midsummer Night's Dream, and I played Bottom the Ass. And uh, one of the things that I was so struck by in that play is that the uh, you know the workmen who put on the play for the royal couples, uh, the royal couples make these you know, sort of kind of snide jokes about the. Um, you know, silliness of the play that they're being entertained by. And uh, I had forgotten all of that uh, until I reread the play, you know, a few years ago. So anyway, as you recall, you know, Bottom gets transformed into an ass, and he spends the night with uh, Titania, uh, the queen of the fairies. So here we go. From the ass's mouth, the theory of the leisure class. Up on stage, in the three-quarters empty auditorium, the lights turned down. Up where the auditorium resounded to a midsummer night's dream, performed clumsily by me, reading out Bottom's speech when he turns from an ass back into a human, while the rest of the class sniggered or flirted, sat back and chewed gum. The words in the auditorium lived out their hour. And after rehearsal, when I got on my bike, red bike, fat tires, to pedal home under cottonwood trees. I turned round corners I'd never seen in our tiny mountain town. Years and years went by. I was still pedaling. It wasn't a dream, except maybe in the way logic works in dreams. I had two heads now, my ass's head, my human head, My ass's bray more eloquent than my human bray of wonder at my change. The eye of man hath not heard, the ear of man hath not seen. My stumbling tongue piecing through Shakespeare's bitter oratory about no bottom to bottom's dream. I put my bike in the carport and started throwing a tennis ball against the brick wall, thinking over and over, no bottom, no bottom. The harder I threw, the more the words weren't mine. The ball smashing brick while there in the auditorium, the words were like a taunt 
like Theseus's taunts spoken behind my back because I was just an ass, not Duke of Athens. But after the play, the cast gave me the paper mache ass's head, and I kept it first in the room I shared with my two brothers, putting it on to sniff the dried glue, feel the claustrophobic fit, and stumble half-blind to the bathroom mirror, where I looked out at myself through holes in the muzzle, the asses painted on eyes and lips what people saw when they saw me. Shakespeare's words booming back from the head's suffocating hollows, coming straight from the ass's mouth, not mine. I don't remember how, but it ended in an alcove above the carport, where it softened on the chicken wire, the paper sagged and began to flake away, the muzzle and the eye hole shriveling into a gray, ulcerous mass. When we moved from that town, it got thrown into the trash, taken to the dump and burned. Onion eaters, garlic eaters, hard-handed men. That's what Bottom and the Mechanicals were. And that's what I was, what I've always been, riding along on my bike's fat tires while that half-god Half-man Theseus laughs his courteous contempt of us whose words come out like a tangled chain. Which is why there's no bottom. Why there's never been a bottom if you're just an ass who speaks prose to the Duke's, ver to the Duke's verse. An ass who kissed the queen of the shadows and never got over it. My long, scratchy ears and hairy muzzle pressed to the ethereal, immortal, almost not thereness of her skin. All right. We had an ass. Um, let's have a fox. Um, you know, I'm a surfer. Uh, I was a surfer. And um, this poem is about, you know, surfing, and then it takes a swerve. There's a, black, there's a beach in San Diego called Black's Beach where I used to surf. Marine helicopters on maneuver kept dipping toward swells at Black's Beach. My board's poise giving way to free fall of my wave tubing over me. Nubs of wax under my feet as I crouched under the lip, sped across the face and kicked out. All over Southern Cal, a haze settled. As if light breathed that technicolor smog at sunset over San Diego Harbor, where battleships at anchor, just back from patrolling the South China Sea, were having rust scraped off and painted gray. This was my inheritance that lay stretched before me, which is when I felt the underbrush give way, and the fox that thrives in my brain not looking sly, but just at home in his pelt and subtle paws, broke from cover and ran across the yard into the future to sniff my gravestone, piss, and move on. And so I was reborn into my long nose and ears, my coats red, white, and brown, giving off my fox smell lying heavy on the winds in the years when I'd outsmart guns, poison, dogs, and wire, when the rooster and his hens clucked and ran, crazy with terror at how everything goes still and that way a fox adores, gliding through slow motion drifts of feathers.
four hens. But that's what a fox would think, right? Um, I'm going to read a couple of poems that uh, come out of some of this uh, foreign uh, journalism, whatever you want to call it. I'm not sure what to call it. Anyway, uh, I was in Libya uh, shortly before the country, um, I, you know, the country was already descending into civil war. And um, I was traveling with a militia. And um, this poem is a kind of elegy for three of the people I was uh, traveling with. The brother leader is what Gaddafi called himself. You always wonder, he could have called himself Generalissimo. Why did he settle on Colonel? He could have been Emperor, he could have been anything. Um, anyway, the brother leader. List. Gunfire, night and day, in the old city won't let up. As the aura of exhaustion floats me beyond sleep, and the planet on its axis tilts back a degree until the world off kilter spins loose from gravity. I'm back crossing desert hard pan, the militia commander napping in the front seat, the sun hazed out so you can't tell sky from pebbled waste. The blasted tanks perspire in mist burning off, their turrets and barrels blistered. Farouz is singing about her broken heart, how her star, like her lover, doesn't whisper to her anymore. In some adjutant's drawer, the brother leader's list of who will be terminated, imprisoned, tortured, goes on and on, name after name that ceases to exist the moment the sentence has been passed. But Ashur, Muhammad, Ali come back to life as I scribble down their names and the wind begins to cuff the Land Rover jouncing until our joints ache and the dead men staring back from between these letters, faces lit up for a moment as they share a smoke, turn away from me, shrugging their shoulders as if to say, who cares? As a Land Rover, shifting gears, disappears into the dust kicked up by its own tires. Litany. Freud means joy in German. I've always loved that. It isn't camels and sheep and an underground house or an abandoned oasis, the shaded grass littered with fallen dates. It isn't tankers lined up on the horizon or sand dunes asking nothing and giving nothing as they creep. It isn't the sculpture of a golden fist crushing a fighter jet or graffiti shouting death or freedom. It's the way vodka in the house of the imam can be hidden in a plastic water bottle. It's Ashur's unpublished papers on prostate cancer. The patient with the catheter released from the hospital for just one night who goes home to his wife and they figure out a way to make love. It's what the German doctor, whose name means joy, meant by the psychopathology of nations. It's the joke about bullets being fired off into the air because the air makes such a good target not even a blind man can miss. It's not the houses burned, the young men shot or kidnapped. It's not the anti-aircraft guns positioned where your house was. It's what no one will say about what no one else will say. It's what anyone 
who knows what they shouldn't say knows. It's what the revolution whispers about one war everywhere in the ear of a drone watching a camel rippling through heat waves on a screen. Let me say. Uh, band? Let's do this. So, I'm going to read a poem. Uh, you ready? Uh, I don't know yet. Huh. Let's try this. Um, I'm going to read a poem from my daughter. All right? And uh, it's because uh, Gerald was there with his daughter. Anyway, in this poem, go ahead, just... Anyway, in, in this poem, what happens is that, uh, you know, my daughter came into my life uh, through divorce uh, when she's about eight years old. And, um, you know, I'm not married, so she's not really my, you know, legally my daughter. So, so we don't really know for a long time what to call each other, even though I, she's 21, so I feel like her father. So we decided that we began to call each other, I began to call her my uh, dear almost daughter, and she began to call me my, her dear almost dad, so now we're each other's dads. So, that works. Second sight. In my fantasy of fatherhood, in which I'm your real father, not just the almost dad arriving through random channels of divorce, you and I don't lie to one another, shrugging each other off when words get the best of us, but coming full circle with wan smiles. When you hole up inside yourself, headphones and computer screen taking you away, I want to feel in 10 years that if I'm still alive, you'll still look at me with that same wary expectancy, your surreptitious, cool-eyed appraisal, debating if my love for you is real. Am I destined to be those shark-faced waves that my death will one day make you enter? You and your mother make such a self-sufficient pair. In thrift stores, looking for your prom dress, what father could stand up to your unsparing eyes, gauging with such erotic calculation your figure in the mirror? Back of it all, when I indulge my second sight, all I see are dead zones. No grandchildren, no evenings at the beach, no bonfires in a future that allows one glass of wine for a shot of insulin. Will we both agree that I love you always, no matter my love's flawed, aging, Partiality? My occupation now is to help you be alone.
Thank you. And I'm going to finish up with um, uh, an excerpt uh, from a poem called uh, Homage to Basho. Um, it's a very brief excerpt from a very long poem. Yeah, maybe it should have just been an excerpt. But anyway, uh, it had to do with, um, uh, I went to Iraq uh, shortly before, well, just when ISIS was establishing itself. And... Um, I was traveling with uh, my friend Christopher Merrill, who runs, runs the uh, International Writing Program, University of Iowa, and we traveled all over the country, uh, meeting with Iraqi writers and professors and uh, students. And uh, at some of these places, English is an immensely popular major there, like over 3,000 majors in the University of Basra alone. Um, and you know, it was a, there was constant um, people being killed uh, because of. Um, all the car bombs going off and the suicide bombings and the reprisal killings. Um, so uh, one of the things we did was we did a writing workshop with uh, the kid and the, you know, the students and they could write in English or they could write in Arabic or a combination of the two. And we set up this um, exercise which was just basically uh, taken from a poem by Joe Brainerd in which you could say, uh, take them back, you know, to you know, some memories in their childhood, the first house they were in. And, and then you say, I remember, I remember, I remember, a new line for each memory. And then at a certain point, we asked them to change that. And we asked them to say, I don't want to remember. And the reality of their lives, which is war, uh, they've never been alive when there wasn't a time of war, first the Iran-Iraq war, uh, then the occupation, and now the quasi-civil war, if you want to call it that, it immediately came into their work. Um, so, uh, one thing, you know, I am a horribly inept, um, I'm not, you know, Brian Williams, I'm not, uh, I'm, I can't possibly put on my fucking flag jacket, I can't figure out. My helmet is always too big. Uh, it's a little bit like Keystone Cops, but Anyway, there you are. You got to put the shit on and pretend you know what you're doing. So, if this is the high bun, which is basically a travelogue punctuated by short poems, and I got the form from uh, Bashel. That's why the poem is called Homage to Bashel. So, I'm going to start somewhere around the middle. I proved myself to be inept at putting on my bulletproof vest. Attaching this to that in all the wrong places before figuring out how to Velcro the waist panels tightly around my stomach so that they were under the vest, not over it, and adjusting and readjusting the shoulder straps to make sure they were tight. I didn't look very military. In fact, I looked like I was wearing a bib, a sort of Rambo Jr. Now that I was strapped into my vest, it felt fairly lightweight, around eight pounds, thick enough according to the specs to give reasonable protection against handguns. But when you consider that a bullet fired from a military-style weapon is the equivalent of a five-pound sledgehammer smashing into you at 45 miles per hour, serious bruising and broken ribs are pretty much guaranteed. I put on my helmet and snapped the chin snap fast, but I had to keep pushing it back from sliding down over my eyes. As I said, rather than protected, I looked and felt like an overgrown infant. In front of our armored vehicle, a Chevy Suburban SUV reinforced with steel plating, a beefy but terminally polite security contractor gave us a briefing. Once you're inside the vehicle, Please stay away from the doors. We'll let you in and out. If we take fire, or if I give you the signal to get down, I'd appreciate it if you could get on the bottom of the vehicle. I'll climb in back with you and cover you. 
Once we get to our destination, you can leave your armor and helmets in the vehicle. Then we'll open the doors and we'll proceed single file to our destination. Everything clear? Lamentation on Ur from a Sumerian spell, 2000 BC. Like molten bronze and iron, shed blood pools. Our country's dead melt into the earth as grease melts in the sun. Men whose helmets now lie scattered, men annihilated by the double-bladed axe. Heavy beyond help, they lie still as a gazelle exhausted in a trap, muzzle in the dust. In home after home, empty doorways frame the absence of mothers and fathers who vanished in the flames remorselessly spreading, claiming even frightened children who lay quiet in their mother's arms, now born into oblivion like swimmers swept out to sea by the surging current. May the great barred gate of blackest night again swing shut on silent hinges. Destroyed in its turn, may this disaster too be torn out of mind. In one of our workshops, a young woman wearing a black and white headscarf with a round face and large black eyes, and with just a hint of mascara on the lashes, stood up to read her poem. Her name was Marion, and she stood very straight in front of her classmates and read to us with a quiet, unselfconscious dignity. Her pronunciation was excellent, so I have a good memory of what she wrote. She said that she was woken near dawn by her older brother in her bedroom, who had bent down to gently kiss her on the cheek and to ask her if she wanted anything special in the market. And when she looked up at him to tell him no, he said to her very gently that this would be the last time she'd be seeing him. But she was so sleepy she couldn't take in what he meant, and a moment later, he was gone. Later that morning, she wrote, she was in the kitchen having breakfast with her mother. And then their neighbor came in and gave them the news. She wrote that as she heard the news, she felt herself get smaller and disappear. She had no hands no face, no body to feel with. There was no kitchen, no mother, no her. The neighbor, she wrote, told them about the car accident. She wrote how she remembers her brother's words coming back to her, how gentle he was when he kissed her on the cheek, how he would always bring her special things from the market. And then she sat down, seeming completely self-possessed, except for the sadness that had come into her voice and hung now in the room. No one said anything for a while. It was what she hadn't said, didn't need to say, since everyone in her generation already understood, resonated for a few moments. Chris and I looked at each other but were slower in grasping what it was she'd left out. And then it dawned on us, too. Her brother had been a suicide bomber and blown himself up in the car. The chopper's sides were open to the night air, and I instinctively shoved myself back on the bench as far as I could get. Not very far, it turned out, certainly not far enough to quell my unease about hurtling through the air with no door in front of me. The contractor gave me thumbs up, 
and I at least knew enough to give thumbs up back, and then the chopper blades accelerated faster and louder. He slid the lenses of his night vision goggles past the lip of his helmet and down over his eyes to keep watch for snipers on the ground, and then slowly we ascended, the nose of the chopper dipping slightly as the tail lifted, and we soared straight up until the pilot adjusted the pitch of the rotors, and we shot ahead, eventually climbing to about a hundred feet over the city. Everything was dark down below for the first quarter mile, and then we were crossing over Baghdad, the lights of the cars on the road flickering softly, hout slice shining in the windows. The pilot occasionally flicked a switch on the instrument panel, and then as we rose higher and the night air got very cold, the contractor slid the Lexan glass doors closed on the passenger part of the tiny cabin. The chopper shimmied back and forth in the light wind, soft buffets, almost the way a child might pet a cat on the head. Just above the pilot's helmet, silhouetted against the curved glass of the windshield, shimmered another little galaxy. Switches glowing in the darkness, an overhead instrument panel lit up the pilot's hand as he leisurely lifted his arm to switch something off or on. For a moment, I had the reverie of myself as a child, looking up at day-glow stars stuck to the ceiling over my bed. A memory I knew to be false since I'm way too old for such things to have existed when I was a kid, nor were my parents the type to indulge me with day-glow stars. I knew, even as I took pleasure in it, that my fantasy was out of sync with the reality on the ground, not to mention the contractor hunching forward, his gun in his lap, intently scanning the darkness below. At least the contractor had his orders and his night vision goggles. What I had to go on was the drone of helicopter noise, its surgical detachment from the neighborhood alleys and streets, and the way my own hypervigilant senses magnified and crystallized the light and dark flow of the city beneath me. One of Saddam's former palaces, encircled by a moat that testified to the dead dictator's love of water, glowed dimly below us, looking like an Arabian Nights fantasy in bad taste and reputed to have a torture chamber in the basement. Aloft in the chopper and looking down, I found and continue to find it hard to know what tone to take when the truth is both atrocious and banal. And if you are on the ground looking up, in an oral history of the Iraq War, I'd come across this account of a pregnant woman, Rana Abdul Mahdi, who lives in Sadr City. Quote, I saw a helicopter floating very high in the air away from me, and I watched as it fired a rocket toward me and my little sister, Zara. She was eight. I felt heat all over my body, and then I was on the ground as the street filled with smoke. There were bodies all around me, and I saw my sister with all her insides spilling out her front. She was reaching for me, motioning with her hand for me to come and help. I saw my left foot was gone. It was sitting there in the street a little ways from me. Before rain. Whatever you do, there are rockets falling, and after the rockets, smoke climbing up through walls that are exploding. Trees grow up, where there once were people. Weeds take over beds of lettuces and coddled flowers. Up-rearing molehills 
unpopulate the fields. The bricked-in hours of the human have all been knocked down. No one lingers at lipstick counters. No one stares into a screen to escape the digital mayhem of heroes hurtling over the heads of monsters. The old bones on the mountain that stand upright and shake when winds blow up from the shore, old bones that shake when the winds roar, now dangle in the void of an unknown dimension. Forget all this, says Earth to the stars. Let's do one last number, and then we'll be done. Gentlemen? I want to read a poem um, for my friend uh, Phil Levine. And uh, I knew Phil for a long time. Um, and I remember one of the very first times I met Phil, uh, he was, you know, you sort of had to pass through a kind of, you know, psychic and spiritual metal detector. <laughs> Uh, because Phil was test you. And so we were talking about uh, Philip Larkin, a poet he particularly loved, and there was one poem in particular uh, that we were talking about. It's a poem called That Grass. It's an early poem. And he really loved uh, one of the lines in the poem that went, uh, it goes, till wind distresses tail and mane. And he looked at me and he said, now, Tom, um, of course you know uh, that when racehorses are, you know, uh, about to race, that they braid their tails in their manes. I said, oh, yeah, I know that, Phil. <laughs> and then Phil said, so basically when he says distress is tail and mane, it means not only ruffle, but it also means that their manes and tails are being untied, which means that they are now no longer racehorses, but at grass. You knew that, right? He said, oh yeah, no, I knew that. <laughs> so this poem, I went to see Phil shortly before he died. And um, you know, the thing about Phil is he was a very funny man. And even on his deathbed, he was just hysterically funny. And you have that kind of sentimental desire to tell a person you love them. And Phil is not of the generation where you I mean, raillery and banter is how you show love. You don't say, I love you. So, you know, after a while, you know, he said, Tom, enough. <laughs> Let's not use that word anymore. It's been overused. I said, all right, that's fine. And the last thing is that Phil had a heart arrhythmia, uh, which, you know, he managed fine all his life just by, by lying down. That word. He sits reading under his desk lamp. He loves how wind distresses tail and mane. He likes the rhymes internal and irregular. How people from the old days walk in and out of the poem. How the father who dies in one stanza can rise in another. How, despite the drought, the rain keeps falling in 14 lines. His rumpled bed is never not specific as the dent his head leaves in the pillow. He rubs his hand across his jaw, unshaven, his touch 
on the back of your wrist is delicate and urgent. When you help him up from bed, he isn't shy about holding on. When he lies back down, he grips his water bottle and won't let go. Smiling says, let's not use that word. It's been used 10,876 times. He shrugs off the weepers, the brotherly lovers, the sour preachers turning purple and blue in their dandruff-sprinkled robes. Out in his backyard in Fresno, the oranges are ripening. At his window in Brooklyn, the plane trees stripped bare of leaves click softly in the breeze. Him in his undershirt, in his tweed jacket, in sweatpants watching Norman Shemansky clean and jerk. Now he's throwing rocks on the bridle path. He's turning into a fox. The brush of his tail mocks the pack. He leaps clear of his own track, doubles back, loses the lords and ladies riding. Now he's preaching to rats, showing them pages in holy books, money books, Books of the entitled that are good to eat and chew right down. But all alone in his study with ice and sun, he scrawls with his fountain pen, crosses it all out, starts again. And this time, Rising up are the sheared away walls of an abandoned high school, a stack of rusted axles, a diner where nobody talks openly of love, but where ketchup and mockery are served up with the coffee and his heart, a rhythmic, pulses out of sync all on its own. Thank you very much.